Okay, okay, welcome. We're gonna get started. Thank you so much for joining us today. Um, we wanna welcome you for this Fulbright Forum entitled Australia's Fulbright Leadership Development Program, supporting alumni to generate systems change. The Fulbright Association extends the Fulbright International Exchange into a lifelong experience for US alumni. We connect alumni and friends of the Fulbright Program through lifelong learning, collaborative networking, and service projects at home and abroad. Through our 57 local chapters, the Fulbright Association hosts more than 230 regional and national programs each year for visiting Fulbrighters and alumni throughout the United States. The Fulbright Forum is taking place in a meeting format today, which means you'll have the opportunity to turn on your camera and or a mute during the Q&A session, which is directly following um, the presentation. Until then, please feel free to leave any questions or comments in the chat. Without further ado, I will now hand it over to John. John? Thank you so much. Um, can we also have a view of the slide, please? I would say that's a good idea. <laughs> Thank you, Angela. Oh, and we're starting with the wrong one. There we go. That's fine. <laughs> Welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you for taking your time today and uh, joining us. Um, so just before I do begin and we introduce ourselves, um, I'd first of all like to acknowledge and pay respect to the Gadigal peoples of the Eora, the Eora Nation. Uh, who are the traditional custodians of the land on which I'm currently based here with the Zoom. And I extend that acknowledgement, obviously, to also the elders past, current and emerging um, of the traditional owners of the land uh, from where all of you are also Zooming in. So welcome. Thank you very much for joining us. We're very excited to tell more about um, the Fulbright Leadership Development Program that myself, Angela and Ian um, founded and with support from a whole range of other people, which we will mention in the talk, uh, we put together in June this year as a residential. Um, so probably the first thing to do is to introduce ourselves. Um, Angela, if we just move to the next slide. So just quickly, we shall do this individually. I'm um, distinguished Professor John Adams. I'm a professor of public health at University Technology, Sydney, and I undertook my Fulbright Senior Scholarship in Boston in 2019. Thanks, John. Hi, everyone. My name's Ian Butterworth. Um, I'm a community psychologist by training. Uh, I did my Fulbright in 2003, 2004 at Berkeley. Uh, and in 2017, I went back on a small alumnus grant to look at some other opportunities. Um, so I'm interested in um, adult learning, and this is really the core of what we're talking about today. Thanks. My name is Angela Heiser. I'm a German Fulbrighter from 1987. I was on a graduate program to Berkeley and did my master's there in Chinese American studies as part of the Fulbright program. And then I had a cultural enrichment grant and worked in New York for the New York Chinatown History Project for a while. And I am currently, and I have been for a long time, a leadership trainer and coach, as well as an emotional intelligence and cultural intelligence specialist. Okay. Thank you, Ian and Angela. Um, just quickly onto the next slide, you can see there just some of the roles that we played, um, but not to go through them in any detail. Um, so probably the best place to start before I we say a lot about the program itself is where did this idea come from and what was it that we were trying to achieve? What was the purpose, uh, the larger framing of this uh, initiative? And really there were three specific things that we were very keen on doing, but I'll provide some context to these in a moment too. The first is that obviously with uh, the Fulbright experience, we wanted to help at least add another layer of uh, strength um, an activity to the connections that alumni might have when they come back to Australia in this case, and look at how we could help nurture collaboration uh, and relationships between Fulbrighters. Obviously, we wanted to also foster ex exchange of ideas. We wanted to try and uh, create a desire and an inspiration for participants and for the Fulbrighters who are coming on the program. Um, 
to think about new ways and further ways in which they might think about their role, uh, both in terms of internally for themselves, developing themselves and their growth, but also obviously in a wider uh, organizational and societal frame. And then also, finally, we wanted to look at, you know, how do we support um, Fulbrighters on their return, but not just in terms of their own aspirations and goals, but thinking much more about, and this is very much something that um, is close to all of our hearts, but Ian in particular has great expertise in thinking about creating positive social change in a wider framework. And this was something we were very keen to uh, have as a focus within this program. Now, just as the a little bit of history about this, the, this was a leadership program idea, which had been spoken about for some time, um, definitely over a number of years. And it, it, it really was an idea whose time had come, because the more that um, I know, speaking for myself, but I suspect Angela and Ian too, in all the networks with the Fulbright that I had, the one thing I kept hearing from Fulbright Australia, also from the Australian Fulbright Alumni Association, I will explain the role of these uh, different organizations in this um, program in a minute. Um, but we, I kept hearing in these networks and in these associations that people, individuals kept uh, anecdotally telling me that even though they came back and they were connected to each other, they really felt like they needed some more glue to bring them all together and to have things to um, really collaborate and partner around. So it, it seemed like a great time to be thinking about running this event. Of course, <laughs> this event was, um, we'd been 18 months uh, previous with the pandemic, uh, not a lot of face-to-face -face meetings. And it was a great opportunity for us with this program and initiative to really think about another way of extending and enriching the Fulbright alumni experience on return. Um, thank you, Angela. We'll go to the next slide. So the application process. So this was a program which we obviously, when we looked at the back catalog of alumni, Fulbright alumni in Australia, there are literally hundreds over the period, over a long period. And we realized that we had to think a little bit about a selection criteria. And we chose, I think it was the last five years of Fulbright alumni, or it may have been six, Fulbright alumni coming back from their Fulbright experience uh, was the first criteria that we used. Um, and it was open to any Fulbright alumni of any scholarship type. Um, and obviously we wanted them to be coming back to Australia. They were Australian citizens who had been on a Fulbright experience. So to put this together, we had an application process. Uh, there were two Fulbright assessors at the Fulbright Australia office, and also two, two of us from, uh, from AFA. Um, and just to quickly say that the Fulbright Australia is obviously the Fulbright um, Association's arm in Australia. And the Australian Fulbright Alumni Association is a separate association, uh, which of which we are all board members and committee members. Um, and we look after uh, alumni events and, and, and um, programs, uh, obviously, for Fulbright alumni in return. The questions that we asked of each applicant were just basically to outline for us their leadership strengths and challenges, things that they may currently be facing and experiencing, what may they like to gain from participating in a program such as this, and what key issues uh, do they see that they think might themselves, they might be keen to see on a program as well, just to get some idea. Um, just to quickly say that this is a program which was co-funded and resourced by AFA, by Fulbright Australia, and also University Technology Sydney, where I'm based. Um, and as we will mention uh, a little later, there were a whole range of people beyond the three of us who were involved in the weekend. And just to say this was a weekend, and we will be outlining for you in later slides the detail of the two days, uh, but it was a residential in Canberra. Uh, in June 2022. Okay, um, Angela, please, the next slide. So as part of the application, we were not just interested in people's CVs and the usual criteria of looking through for curiosity and interest and passion. 
But we also ask people to identify for us challenges, leadership challenges that they might be facing or they could identify at the moment. This was a nice way of us of gathering some intelligence for our program as well, which we could then feed into its design. But there were a number of levels, if you like, or themes that came out of that data. And it really, what I really want to stress here is just the diversity of challenges that people acknowledged and identified, all the way from uh, domestic, family and personal challenges around life events, things like uh, having a family, um, obviously different domestic duties, there might be promotions at work, that type of thing. And then also we have the um, uh, communication, networking, things about their personality or their approach or style to relationships and being with other people was another area that people noticed. And then also uh, a much wider social cultural context of challenges that people were currently, obviously we were all feeling to some degree around the pandemic, uh, the conflict in Ukraine, um, some anxiety, but also some opportunities around social media and, of course, climate crisis. Um, and we integrated a lot of these areas of challenges as identified by the participants prior to them coming to the weekend. Just one thing I'd like to say before I um, move the slides over is that from around 50 applications, we finally chose 33 applicants to join us for the weekend. And one thing to stress is the diversity of the participants. And this was very important to us as the organizers and facilitators, that we had uh, a nice representative mix of a whole range of different demographics. We had a pretty much 50-50 split male-female. Uh, we covered um, a lot of different disciplines, both in the academy, but also a lot of areas in industry were also well represented. We had people from all corners of Australia and all the major states, I think, bar one, were actually represented because we wanted to get a geographical mix for people, too. So we weren't just crowding in one state. And also um, we had a, um, a number of indigenous Fulbrighters who joined us and also some from culturally, linguistically diverse backgrounds and heritage as well. Um, and we were also just to re-emphasize in terms of this spread, we were also keen to not only get senior Fulbrighters with scholarships, but also people with postgraduate, PhD, and postdoc um, Fulbrighters too. So we had a really nice mix of individuals. And this, I think, helped for the weekend as well in bringing a lot of curiosity, a lot of different perspective and reflection. Thank you. Okay, so just some of, I'm not gonna go through all of these, but we we went all out with, we, we just went with all the adult learning principles and we tried to incorporate as many as we could, um, make sure that not every, that we weren't sitting around tables all the time, but there was a lot of movement designed of, you know, in, in um, integration exercises that literally got people moving through space. We had some metaphorical exercises where people, didn't know they were working on leadership when in fact they were. And then we had some lovely debriefs afterwards that created a lot of big aha moments. Um, we had um, lots of personal reflection exercises. So we asked people to journal. We gave people exercises overnight so that they could think about things. Um, and then we, we, we went literally from individual to small work to large group so that everybody got to work on on their level because of course sometimes the introverts need to be accommodated as much as the extroverts so those were some of those um then friday night this is the program a very rough overview we had the arrival then we had obviously the acknowledgement of country and then we talked about guidelines and logistics and gave everybody the social media hashtag so we could post about it because that's one thing that we'd never really done We'd not really been big on social media, so we thought this was really a good event to promote and show people that we were doing something that was really important to us. Um, there was lots of socializing and getting to know each other. Again, the pandemic probably helped, but people were like, they were buzzing and getting together and having a lot of fun. We did a little bit of weekend orientation so people knew what was happening because we kept a lot of it open. We wanted people to go on an exploratory learning rather, journey rather than telling them what to expect. Because 
there was there's this whole thing of when you tell somebody what they should learn they narrow down their thinking and they get to that learning goal good little adults that we are and instead what we said is is just open your mind and just play like a child because you're all experienced leaders or you're totally new on the leadership journey. I mean, we literally had people who had never been in a leadership position and were just starting out to people who had been leaders for 40 years. So we just really had to incorporate all of those groups. And um, so the initial exploratory exercise worked really well and was a really great aha moment. And then we sent people home and said, please do you know, start thinking about what you want to achieve in this course if you haven't. So the next morning we had a morning activity, which we also called run, walk and sit. So you had the choice, people had the choice to have an early morning run with John. They could go for a walk with me or they could have a coffee with Ian. And that was really great because it involved people, um, you know, getting together and having chats outside of the forum, which was really important. We did some more framing and then we did goal setting, which again went from individual to small group to big go big group. And we looked at why people, what was the whole purpose of this? And then we introduced some, um, some, some leadership tools and some principles that were really useful also with regards to the challenges that they were facing. Um, so we, we brought it from individual to bringing it down and we ended up with a group goal, which is always good because it unites people under one banner. So find your own style to confidently develop leadership in self and others. So that was the guiding principle and the goal that underlay the whole course. Sunday after Saturday afternoon, more tools. Again, all of the, a lot of these were practical, involving movement, involving group discussion, um, all sorts of different tools and um, more exploration of personal challenges. Then um, Ian introduced the learning implementation plan. And then we um, spent the rest, um, a, a little part of the afternoon, hearing from um, Tara Holly Whitfield from Fulbright about what Fulbright does for everybody. And then um, Farouk Martin, Peter Jarvis and Vanessa Adams start uh, talked about the mentoring program that we are now offering from AFA to returning Fulbrighters. In the evening, we had a wonderful dinner. It was really superb, beautifully organized in what was it called? The, the newsroom? Yes. So there were all these newspapers hanging on the wall and it was, um, yeah, we shared and um, Christian Bennett, who is the Fulbright Australia board member, gave a really inspiring presentation and it was a really great way to connect and cement the connections. So this was the only photo we have of the whole committee who were absolutely instrumental in keeping things going in the background and um and uh you know because we needed logistic support in really big way so that was also um there were other people involved um and we couldn't have done it without them saturday morning we had our run walk talk a sit then we we asked people to come up with what they thoughts they had had what questions they had and then we started expanding into the regional we had seated people her interest on Saturday and now we switched people to the regional chapter so we set them by geography so we started looking at how can we bring people together so they can create some impact in their own geographical area so we helped them create their their leadership goals and then we started be moving beyond the you know because it was not going to be a uh, happy clappy two days, two and a half days of, yes, we're all having a wonderful time together because we wanted people to really take these things and make a difference when they got back and keep the ball rolling. And then Ian started with his World Cafe action planning, which was great because if you want to know more about that, unfortunately, we won't be able to get into that, but that's a really, really great way to create great cooperation and exchange in a group. So this is some of the action planning that we had. Um, and people came up with some really good stuff. And a lot of this stuff has been actualized already. And then in the afternoon, we had, um, there was space for indigenous present present presentations with indigenous Fulbrighters, um, facilitated by Rod Kennett. They, they, they screen, they screen, um, zoomed in just like Tara did. And we kept working on the learning implementation plans and we had a lovely integration exercise that people told us afterwards really made a difference. And then we sadly all left. So I'm going to talk about the learning implementation plans. The whole purpose of this uh, weekend was anchored on Neil Brookfield's 
uh, definition of adult learning, which is helping people to understand and act on the personal, social, occupational, and political environments in which they live. And we constructed a learning implementation um, um, exercise for people to actually start to anchor everything they had discussed over that day and a half and turn it into an action plan that was clearly anchored on their own particular goals, um, being clear about the why, thinking about some of the people and resources that they could draw on to help them actually achieve their goal or at least work systematically towards it, getting people to think about barriers they might encounter and thinking then about well, which of those can I actually control or influence which are outside my control. So helping people zone in on the areas of activity and the external environment that they actually had some opportunity to influence. So that's the first five questions. And then the following four, Angela. Yep. Um, we then asked people to drill down into the activities. So starting to unpack the goal into a set of actions that they could address, thinking about who they needed to engage in that activity, both people and organisational. Thinking also in question eight about the support mechanisms that they could draw on to, for, for, to help them keep their momentum and resilience up. And finally, thinking about uh, how would they know? So actually framing, anchoring or bookending their goal with some indicator, indicator of success. Um, we're preparing a draft manuscript for publication in the Fulbright Chronicles, and we'll unpack this in far more detail. But um, shortly, I'll go through some of those components just to show you the linkages between the goals, the actions, and some of the immediate and longer term outcomes that people have achieved. Next slide, Angela. Um, so after we had we had a brilliant young intern working with us, Afa. Uh, we we another success measure for Afa is that we had our first we launched an internship program this year, and our first intern was a spectacular young person who was actively involved throughout the two days in capturing conversations, but also administering a survey monkey tool um, after the workshop and then following up with post-workshop um, phone interviews with people about two weeks after the event. Um, so some of the evidence we're about to share with you come from the Survey Monkey and some of the conversations that, um, that our, our intern Steph had. But just before, um, in the last couple of weeks, we've been reaching out to our participants for some stories about change that's happened in the four months since the program. What I'm sharing with you now is just the immediate evaluation at the completion of the course that people finished uh, completed online and as you can see um, overwhelmingly I mean we're not just cherry picking here we're really proud to say that the the evaluations were overwhelmingly affirmative um, and we did specifically ask for feedback about how to make it better and we'll share that with you a bit later on but as you can see um, people really did value the weekend um, and in fact, one of the markers of success was that 18 people said they'd like to help contribute to future iterations of this program, both in terms of organising, uh, presenting, delivering, peer mentoring, things like that. Um, back to you, Angela. Okay, so there was, we called that not the end, the end but the beginning, because um, this was, you know, people had really bonded and there was... <clears> a, it's been really lovely. I've been meeting with people and we've had some really lovely get togethers. Um, artists. So there's a whole new vibe that I, you know, that is really, really lovely. It's, it's a really sense of a real sense of community, which is great because we all develop this identity of being a Fulbrighter, but it's the community that really supports us in, in making a difference as well, because it's not just us, but we can together achieve something, which I think was the whole point of, of Senator Fulbright's proposal. So that was our farewell. Um, yes. And we're back and I, to just, yeah, just for some <laughs> context, I mean, Australia's population is about 25 million people, typically clustered in, in a, a handful of major cities, but the geographical distance between those cities is enormous. Um, and some of our colleagues 
I mean, we, we had one person that came from a desert community in Western Australia. Um, so, so that's part of the reason why this program was really important. It brought a very geographically dispersed group of people together. Now, in terms of the implementation plan, these are some fairly rough uh, numbers here, um, but roughly half of the um, implementation goals were around acting at the personal level. So changing aspects of people's personal lives, how they viewed or dealt with situations, how they um, view themselves, how they, um, to, and also how they improve their skill set. But also some people did want to <clears throat> implement their, their, their leadership at an organisational level, changing elements of the environments in which they worked. Uh, and others wanted to launch into sort of community capacity building, changing elements of this, the social and wider economic and political system in which they lived and worked. Angela? So at that personal level, um, just so you can unpack the particular um, activities that people wanted to work on, or the particular goals they had, they wanted to um, enhance their own sense of empowerment, their own impact in terms of the ideological world in which they, they were working and um, participating as, as activists. People wanted to enhance their skills. They wanted to expand their opportunities for professional growth and um, career development. Um, and a lot of people also wanted to develop um, themselves at a personal level by engaging in the Fulbright network. So it's kind of that nexus of um, personal and organisational um, capacity building. Angela? Um, in terms of the activities that people planned to take, um, I, you, some of these slides will have um, information grouped in different coloured boxes and the blue represents personal, the red represents organisational and the orange represents uh, systems or broader, broader thinking. Um, so at a personal level, one person intended to write better job applications um, to expand their skills around evaluation, to follow up and meet with their networks. Another person wanted to use AFA to, um, you know, expand their leadership, uh, reach and impact. And another person wanted to um, expand and enhance uh, their relationships with their stakeholders, for example. That's just a, a potted example of some of those planned activities. Next slide, Angela. Um, just to give you a snapshot into the support mechanisms that people plan to draw on, uh, by far the largest segment there was people drawing on their own professional networks and mentors uh, that they already had. But others did see AFA um, in terms of the uh, mentoring program as a really important opportunity, and other people still had other resources at a more diffuse level out in their social system. Angela? So this was one of the final questions. <clears throat> How would you know if you had achieved what you wanted to achieve? And as you can see there, they've been grouped into the personal blue, the red organizational and the orange uh, systemic. But as you can see here, it's, it's, um, it's perceptions of their life being in a different way, uh, having feelings of confidence and agency, um, achieving some personal goals around publication or achieving fellowships. Um, I love this longer quote, I will have a full-time position, live in one place and be more available to pursue non-worked based goals. So that person <laughs> was going for a total life transformation, um, which I found really encouraging. Others wanted some organisational level outcomes, a seat at the table, um, having their own research centre, and at a broader level, at the systems level, um, one person would would had identified that they would see changes to their uh, their stakeholder network, and um, they would have held an event which would have generated um, community engagement. So a nice range of success measures there. Now it's back to Angela to talk about what's happened at AFA. Lots. It's a we've got 
new people. We've got a, the, the biggest committee ever, I think. We've got 11 members now. We've got two people who joined straight from the program and two people who were inspired by the program. Um, we've got lots of local chapter events with a Victorian network planning, a summit for the Refugee Week for next year. Um, we've had the mentoring program expand. Um, so that we've got new mentors and new mentees, which has been really successful. People are raving about the program. And um, we also have a new subcommittee for social media so that we can actually get some presence and invite people to participate and share accomplishments, share achievements, as well as um, progress, you know, any kind of um, in, in invitations. Really, it's to network. And then um, the, the Dudley bequest uh, was something that we also very grateful for. Uh, Susanita and Earl Dudley, who were very, very engaged um, AFA members, who were always participating on committee level and who made a big difference in the community, both unfortunately passed away within a year and they, they left a very generous bequest to AFA for further Fulbright um, and AFA leadership development programs. So we're very grateful for that. Um, within the, the participants group, there has been lots of activity. There's again, we're, we're getting information from people sharing with us that they're applying for more leadership roles that they would have not applied for if it hadn't been for the program, because they're now able to apply the skills that they have learned. They're using the tools to influence, um, to work as in, in supervision and supervisory roles. Um, they are signing on to the mentorship program. And um, they're really testing their mettle. They're really stepping into a leadership role, which was what this whole point was. We really wanted people to take some new skills back into their workplace and then take that and step up on to community level. And that seems to be happening um, because there's a lot of activity. And we're actually looking at um, planning an event in Alice Springs at some point. Um, but Ian can tell you more about that if you're interested. Oh, shall we have that <laughs> as a next as a next report? Yeah. Okay. So that snapshot that Angela just shared was captured by our intern Stephanie Stephanie Sestak with phone interviews about two or three weeks after the weekend, and um, just in the last couple of weeks, we've gathered gathered some email stories from people, and here are four quotes um, about what people have done, where they are now in terms of four months later. And as you can see, people have taken on more leadership roles. Um, there's evidence that um, one person's gone on to establish uh, a disability advisory group for, for higher education, national level that he's leading. Um, some Another person's made a significant career move to a different university uh, at a more senior level. Um, and another person, the final quote, is that they've used what they've learned to actually enhance how they lead teams and people themselves, um, as well as building new networks across the Fulbright community. Um, this other, the other question we asked people to share via email was, what are the, what's something they've taken with them that they value? So it's not just about what they've done, but what they're holding on to, I guess, as a feeling or a memory of that event. Um, and I guess the the evidence of lasting value is the inspiration and the sense of being part of a community that people have taken with them and they're still using at the moment. Um, so it's about reconnecting people to the inspiration um, that uh, connecting with other Fulbrighters often delivers. I, I, and one thing we could have put in here was that people challenge their imposter syndrome. And a lot of people have come away having put the imposter syndrome to bed saying it's I have a right to be at this table um, I'm okay um, that was a really strong theme about what people brought to them and I think what people have taken away from them is that it's reminded people that um, they have a right to shine their own light and uh, and again that lovely quote at the end there um, a person took away that um, their higher purpose is is something that they can and are working on which is really support really superb and finally, we're on to our last slide, which is what we've learned. The three of us are going to jump in here. Um, I'm happy to say a few words here, Ian. Um, so yeah. obviously, running the weekend was spectacular. We all had a wonderful time. I know the participants, as you've just shared, did too. 
One of the things that was mentioned earlier by Angela, but I think it's worth mentioning here as feedback for ourselves is the uh, challenge of running a leadership weekend where most participants or some participants may want quite a lot of information up front. And this was something that came out in the feedback for improvement, uh, just giving people a heads up of what kind of sessions and material we would cover. But having said all that, one of the beauties of the weekend was, as Angela mentioned earlier, we don't want to give people specific tasks and material uh, and details early before the residential because then it kind of frames their thinking. And we were very keen in getting people to react and be organic in the situation and and, um, and let things kind of develop uh, in situ, I suppose, is the best way to describe it. Um, we also need a better preparation for people with disabilities. We did have someone living with a disability who was a participant. Um, and that was also noted that we probably need to keep an eye on that accommodation as well on the program for the weekend. Um, and also a consideration of the gender balances at tables. Um, obviously, we, we had other criteria sometimes that we were grouping people by, but uh, that's something definitely we can reflect on and think more if we run this program again. Mm. Yeah. I think the other thing just quickly to say before anyone else jumps in is just about the resourcing of the weekend. And I know there's yes. been a Q&A chat that we can talk about funding later, but one of the things to mention is that just, just the, the quite sizable number of other people who are involved over the weekend to help facilitate not only running sessions, but doing a lot of behind the scenes work and uh, our UTS team, uh, two people from our centre, including myself, uh, in addition to myself, were also there for the whole weekend looking at the logistics and organising things. And I think that can't be underestimated by anyone who's running a residential weekend like this in leadership. The important thing to add, uh, I think, too, in terms of not only a backbone organisation, but resourcing in terms of funding, it's important to flag that we could not have done this without a grant from the United States Embassy, um, which Fulbright Australia um, bid for in collaboration with AFA. Um, that that helped to pay for accommodation, reimbursement of flights, catering, et cetera, et cetera. But all of us put in significant amounts of in-kind support, uh, including John's team, but also Angela and myself, all the committee members, uh, and in our final report to the US Embassy, we we costed uh, and quantified the in-kind support to show that um, it was very much a partnership that included um, cash and in-kind support from the Fulbright community. Angela, what are your thoughts? Well, we came away, away from this buzzing. Um, we were, I mean, everybody. I mean, we we were very fortunate that we there was there. We all went to the airport together somehow, and we ended up in a cluster. And we had a, a little farewell party afterwards, um, which was really lovely. But we've been connecting, and it, it's what's been what's been really wonderful to see is people come back and say, "I've been using this. I've had a realization about this." This has really made a difference. So people are communicating. We've got a real surge in social media as well. People are engaging with our posts and we're working on making that even more effective. But there's been there's been so much cooperation, so much we've we I feel that we've really created a community. Um, and I think that's that's what we set out to do because that's what we've had in the committee, and we really wanted to expand that throughout the whole of Australia. And um, and again reconnect connect Fulbright and AFA so we can we can make that work together because it's a great it's it's a great way of going we're we're, de we're we're supporting you before you go while you go and when you come back and that I think is what this is all about it is about connecting people and bringing people together so I'd really like to thank everybody who participated in this I'd like to Tara the committee um, the two amazing Aboriginal um, Indigenous um, scholars, Sue, Sue Stanton and Catherine Gilby, um, you know, and, and Stephanie Sestak, who was the photographer behind the scenes who provided all of these photos. Jala Wong, who worked with John, who was the copier from heaven. She was just a, a whiz. And Dr. Amy Steele, who came and gave moral support um, and some really practical advice. So thank you all. And if I've missed anybody, please, we know we were there. And maybe John and, and Ian can think of them, but 
this could not have been done without everybody's participation. It was done by tribe effort, really. Mm. I guess the thing I'd like to, we, I mean, one of the reasons we wanted to present and share this with the Fulbright Association is that we believe we have a model that is scalable and can be adapted for use in other contexts. Um, clearly, the resourcing was a huge lever that enabled us to get on and do this. Um, but we probably could have found a way to have done it um, in a scaled back version, even without the funding from the US Embassy. Um, it would have looked different. But I guess what we'd like to encourage those of you who are uh, participating today to think about adapting this for use in your own environment. It can be done. And um, we'd love to help you think about finding the necessary resources to run versions of it in a way that meets your reality um, and also meets the needs and aspirations of your community. Yeah. All right. Let's open up the chat, shall we? Yes, I think we we have um, one uh, question that John, um, I think John Bader asked, which was around funding, but we can answer that directly, which is, did participants have to pay for any aspect of the program? And the answer is that we're through the funding that Ian mentioned from the US Embassy and also the resourcing from UTS, the AFA, and Fulbright Australia, we managed to cover all of the cost of the weekend in terms of hotel rooms, um, also in terms of uh, facilities and uh, program dinner. Uh, and we gave uh, a fairly generous, but probably not full reimbursement for people's flights, depending on where they were coming from. So there was a little bit of financial input from the participants themselves, but um, I think it's safe to say the majority of what was the expenses were covered by the program. Um, so that's to cover that. Um, I wonder if we could open it to anyone else who may not have posted a chat, who may want to ask us another question. <clears throat> yeah, Arthur says it's, um, uh, thanks for the very interesting practical application of harnessing knowledge and long-term commitment from Fulbrighters. It's a good model for thinking of comparative possibilities. And I think, Arthur, that to, to Ian's point on that, uh, there is really probably a need for this type of program in other parts of the Fulbright program, I think, in other geographies. Um, and I think it would definitely, from our experience, it's, um, as was mentioned, you've heard many positives that came out of the weekend and the program. But I think the other is, uh, simply creating community, ongoing community and connections and commitments. And people gained confidence from the weekend. And as we mentioned, most very highly senior individuals, but also fresh, green, newly emerging researchers, academics and industry uh, individuals were there as well as part of the program. So it was a real opportunity for everyone to mix, share ideas and just create a sense of community. And, uh, and as I say, give some confidence. John. Hey, guys. Um, Hi. So if, if you don't know me, my name is John Bader. I'm the executive director of the Fulbright Association. So this has been a tutorial for me. And, I, <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and well-timed in the sense that um, we are going into a strategic planning process next year in which uh, ideas and new initiatives like this one that you're doing in Australia is very provocative. Uh, we've, we've offered a, a national conference uh, that has had some elements of this for almost 50 years, um, but uh, not the kind of concentration that you have offered during that particular weekend on personal leadership development. Um, also framing it as leadership development is provocative by itself um, as opposed to career development uh, so that's that's very interesting i'm i'm gonna it could take me a while to process all that you're doing but i think you've already identified the probably the biggest challenge to the scalability and that is money um, <laughs> i mean um, 
the the idea that um, there would be an entity that would effectively pay for a, a weekend for forty people to do all this uh, is exceptional and extremely rare. <laughs> um, so, I mean, congratulations to you. That's uh, that's fantastic. Um, you're probably wondering where my where where my questions coming from. Um, what I'd like to know is. It, in what way was this sort of a special Fulbright experience? Obviously, the Fulbright community is what you drew from, but in what ways did you kind of weave in uh, the program itself, its mission, its you know, mm. its uh, it, its mm. its special mm. sauce? Go ahead. Could I could I could I talk about that, Angela and John? Yes. Um, one of the one of the things we did quite early on in the piece was to encourage the participants to look at the mission and vision statements for AFA and compare it with the, the Fulbright program itself and to help people think about where their own leadership vision aligned best. Um, I was president for seven years and I guess the my fingerprints are over the some of the sort of formal documentation mm -hmm. for AFA. I've stepped off the committee recently and it's now in a, for an amazing new um, iteration um but AFA uh, we have a strong vision that we actually exist to provide um a meeting place for for Fulbrighters to come together and work together to create social and systemic change and that's a different mission to the Fulbright program which is to create the opportunities for the scholarships in the first place right, right. as well as to create the respectful intercultural learning at a very high level. I guess we, we, we've we positioned ourselves and the Fulbright Australia um, is now working very closely with us because they understand it and support our mission. We're what happens when people get back. Um, and so people had a sense of, of an opportunity to align themselves in their, their, their group goal and their um, personal leadership goals. It, it came naturally that AFA was a kind of fulcrum for that. Uh, we weren't trying to corral people into that process. In fact, we were very open for, for thinking about how AFA could maybe change based on what people's leadership goals were. But there was a natural alignment with AFA's stated mission and goal to, to, to be that sort of opportunity for, for helping people change the world, which is what a lot of Fulbright scholars well, that's have that the, for. And, and that, if you don't mind, Ian, that, that, that's a a theme that we've been talking about much, much more. I mean, as the world seems to crumble um, and we're facing oh, yeah. our mid midterm elections here, as you probably well know, uh -huh. um, uh, we have been asking the question about whether Fulbrighters should be see themselves and the world should see them as agents of change. Um, yes. And mm -hmm. I think the answer to that is yes. Um, mm -hmm which is why we've been thinking about realigning some of our programming and efforts toward public service and community outreach much, much more. Um, mm -hmm. We have a program called Fulbright in the Classroom, which is designed to take the Fulbright experience to, especially to underrepresented communities, um, to talk about the world around us and to demystify what it looks like and, ten and, and sort of secondarily to promote uh, study abroad and and mm -hmm. and of course the Fulbright program as a sort of tertiary goal, um, uh, which is one reason why we're working. We hope with the Gates Foundation that uh, is in conversation with us about funding an expansion of that program. Um, but the question is, you know, are you have you realigned your mission statement? Therefore, that looks more like we're here to develop your leadership skills um, or we're wow. here to, to create a cadre of people who will change the world. Is, has it become explicit as a result of this leadership uh, weekend or is it kind of embedded in what you're doing and still, still a kind of part of what you do? Mm. I, I think, uh, John, the weekend actually embodied both of those principles okay. in terms of obviously there was a particular focus on the individuals and getting them to feel like they had more confidence and to gain skills and insights mm -hmm. and reflect. 
but 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 as Ian said, there was a, a really the, uh, part of the main um, impetus for running this program was the idea that as Fulbrighters we come back, we may meet each other, we may connect, we feel we're part of a special family, a very inclusive network of people. But exactly your point, John, what are we doing in the wider context for change, for good, for positive um, mm. developments? And I think that's where a lot of people gained a lot from the weekend too, particularly from um, the kind of things that Ian was telling them about action plans in community action, um, giving them a praxi for how they might start to think in their own orbit, how they might uh, be, be far more instrumental and building on their Fulbright brand to do that and their Fulbright training and their experience. So it is very deeply connected with Fulbright. Um, and it wasn't a case this just was run with Fulbrighters. It right. was very much saying, what is your future Fulbright leadership going to look like mm. for you? Angela, I don't know Angela's got some thoughts there. Well, for me, I mean, obviously, as somebody who's very passionate about leadership development, because again, a lot of people are in roles where they are experts, subject matter experts, but they don't necessarily know how to inspire and lead people and, you know, create the momentum that that is needed to expand something. So our goal was to have something that was very practical that would that would provide people with the tools to go out and do it because again there we had people who had just come back from a, from a, from a Fulbright um, adventure let's call it that and they wanted to do something but they didn't necessarily have the skills and I encounter that in my work a lot people have the passion but they don't necessarily have the tools so our goal was to combine the two make it really practical for them to take steps forward and make a difference in the world but having the tools to be able to do that to lead themselves as well as well as others um just following on from Angela maybe <laughs> maybe our presentation could have become could have begun with AFA's vision statement which we've had for several years and I'll just read it out to you John and participants our vision is for a vibrant and diverse connected community including alumni in the broader society who share have a shared sense of belonging and provide each other with support and an enduring sense of being a Fulbrighter um, the vision is that we interact with one another to share ideas and knowledge inspire others and promote free thinking debate and ideas challenge the status quo for a better australia and a better world it's a bit wordy and that needs to be worked on but as you can see in many ways or well, in most ways this leadership program was actually us fulfilling our vision yeah. um yeah well i can so we've had that for a long time i um i'm, I'm sorry to monopolize and i know Elise oh, is, going to, is going to shut us down now but um um I hope that you'll uh, be available for follow-up questions or outreach. Um, uh, oh, yes, uh, okay. love to love to talk to you more. Um, I I wish you well and congratulations on a fantastic uh, uh, success. And Thank we'll be John. in touch. Thank you, John. Thank Alicia you, John. has our emails, I believe. I look forward to being talking to you. Take care. Yeah, us too. Thanks. You're on mute, Alicia. <laughs> Of course, <laughs> of course I am. Um, well, thank you all so much for joining us. Um, this uh, meeting, this webinar, this forum is recorded. Um, once it's edited, all of that good stuff we will share with everyone. We'll put it up on our website. Um, thank you again for attending. Any last words you want to share with us before we go? We thank would you. love to collaborate <laughs> with you folks. Yeah, okay. thanks, Angela. All right. Sounds good. Bye, everyone. <laughs> Thank you. Take Lisa. care. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.